Four years ago, the British Quantel company developed the Paint Box, a computer designed to produce television graphics. Broadcasters quickly took it up to create their weather maps, graphs and title sequences. Some months ago, we introduced David Hockney to a paint box, the first serious artist to try the machine. What he was confronted with was a perfectly plain work surface coupled to an electronic pen. The artist works directly onto a television monitor and he can summon up palettes of color, mix them or alter them at will, even select different widths of brush or pen. Hockney began to discover that the paint box could be more than a tool for designing graphics. He saw it as a new medium, and one which offered the artist a new facility, that of literally painting with light. For the onlooker, this experiment turned out to be a rare chance to follow the evolution of an image from start to finish. Not a painted canvas reproduced by a film or video camera, but a picture made directly onto the television screen. By the time our camera crew were ready and David Hockney's microphone put on and connected, he was already deeply absorbed in the paint box, oblivious to the lights and the people around him. For nearly eight hours, almost without stopping, he worked on the computer. We've condensed the images he made during the course of that day, and later David Hockney recorded the commentary you will hear. Well, I'm just... Uh trying out this machine here. Um, that little cross uh, represents uh, the point. I'm actually drawing on a uh, just a blank board and it leaves no marks behind. So what you're actually seeing is the original. There's no uh, piece of paper left. You're not drawing on a piece of paper. You're drawing, uh, uh, you're drawing actually directly onto this TV screen where you're seeing it now, in a way. There is no distance between you and the mark being made, actually. This is the mark being made on the screen. And um, it doesn't exist in any other form. This is a palette. You have to keep going, finding a color, finding a way. There's different marks you can make, even though you're making them with all the same instrument that's a bit like a kind of old-fashioned ballpoint pen. There you press paint, wash, and so on. I don't know what I'm doing. Actually, I'm just... Uh... Bit of experiment. Yeah. Just... The light in your eyes doesn't bother you too much. Oh, yeah. If it stops drawing... This is merely a piece of lighted glass you're looking at. And, of course, that's the medium you're drawing with, essentially. Light on glass. And uh, the only equivalent where you'd get colours like this, it did occur to me, is uh, in stained glass itself, which is using also light and glass. And you can get a richness of colour, of course, that you even paint. Um, can't give, it has a kind of glow. Um, here it has almost a neon glow. I'm just gonna try layers. I'm gonna draw with layers, see what happens, make it something eventually, but I like the layers.
Here it's like old television, you're watching the artist at work. But in the old way, the camera would have had to have been looking over your shoulder. And whatever colour you were putting on a canvas, it wouldn't come out the pure colour you're putting it on because the distance of the camera from the piece of paper would cause it to um, be different. Here, um, there isn't any distance. That colour is the colour made. You're mixing it there. Uh, these were all drawn from my head, actually. I didn't uh, make any notes beforehand, which you can probably tell why. Remember, I, I'm not saying this as I'm drawing. This sound is recorded later. Uh, because I couldn't talk and draw at the same time. I couldn't be giving a commentary at all. And especially this way, because you've to really... You're concentrating in a weird way. I mean, I, I, if I look down when I'm making this mark, as I said, there's nothing there. So uh, you have to keep it in your head as you're accumulating a, a scheme of things and watch it draw. I want to mix a collar now. OK. <clears throat> um, well, it's easier to do it with a large brush to start with, so I, I should... Um, no, you, 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 yeah, put uh, a, I should put paint on. If paint I, on? Yeah, that's it. And, and select and, a sort of and, harsh job at the bottom there. Right, right. OK, so... Now just you, take a colour. Take a colour. Pick a colour, any colour. Right, now if you slosh some down... The, there you go. It's, 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 it's the peripheries there where, where it's, it's overlapping the white, you're actually getting a paler tone of that. You can, yeah. you can select that. So you know still keep mixing, can't oh, I? Yeah. Better on mixing. Let me yeah, see. I haven't tried the mixing too much. Yeah. Tell you what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get a viridian green. Yeah. OK, so if you can perceive any tiny sort of point there which has something like the colour you want, by pressing down at that point. It can be really very accurate. drawing with coloured crayons, they're all laid out in front of you, you just pick up the one you see. Here, you, it's not quite like that. Um, so you tend to think of what you can do with one colour first and then use another, whereas with different crayons you might be swapping them about in your hand a great deal faster than you could here.
These are just crude beginnings, really. But I, I can see there's a lot of possibilities. One thing you can do on this that you can't do with paint is, of course, you can put a very brilliant color, very brilliant blue, and you could draw with, on it with a brilliant red. Well, of course, in paint, if you put the red on top of the blue, um, you're going to get, even if you use thick red on thin blue, um, and even if it's dry, you're going to get, make the red into slightly into purple and so on. Well, uh, that doesn't happen here. You, you can put it on thin or you can put it on, as it were, thick. Therefore, the moment you've changed, you're changing the actual surface of the glass all the time. It isn't layered, it's just um, that's now going on top of the glass, the red, there you can see. Well, it's certainly as pure a colour as you wish it to be. Um, because, in a sense, when you put the white there, it's taking off the red underneath it, isn't it? It's removing it. The computer's removing that. In a sense, you could go on forever drawing each one of these, because you can just keep changing it, changing it, and take everything out. I mean, in a sense, if this was on paper, there's a limit to what you can do, because even if you decided to alter all the shapes, I mean, after you've put down two colours on top of one another, if you put a third down, you're going to get mud, really. Uh, it, nothing would glow. I think it does open up, as I say, a lot of possibilities. It seems to me the best thing you can do on, on it is draw, uh, which would make it more interesting, because drawing is more interesting than photography. Ultimately, it's more real as well. It is a new medium, I've no doubt that it is a new medium, and it uses, it makes the television a different kind of medium. It, it could be more honest in the sense, as I say, it acknowledges surface. The picture on the screen is a perfectly honest picture in the sense that it's made up of all the material that's making the picture on the screen. I mean, it's made that way. I get bolder because I realize uh, more and more what you can do, how you can remove something.
You don't wouldn't draw exactly like this on a piece of paper. Uh, because as I say, you can't there's a, a limit to how many layers you can put on a drawing in a sense. <coughs> it simply will go dull after it. But um uh I think what you're seeing here is me me simply exploring it, what, what you can do. This is, uh, I think this is Pembroke Studios. I was trying to remember where I'd come from that morning. Can you just put that away? Yeah, sure. And uh, stop this. I was trying to draw uh, Francis Bacon, who I'd seen on television the night before, uh, when he was saying. He was an optimist about nothing. He said, why am I? I'm an optimist about what? About nothing. Which amused me because I thought, well, you could be a pessimist about nothing as well. Uh, but I was trying to draw a portrait. It, it all fails, this, I think. Uh, well, they left it in. I suppose it's like sketchbooks or something you, you you do some things and you abandon them you don't carry on with the drawing As you can see, the drawing all gets a bit lost. You try, I'm trying to do something I frankly did not know how to uh, do it in the end. If I was doing it with paint, you'd know ways to do it, how you make subtle differences in colour, you know, just a slight uh, difference. I haven't used this machine long enough to find out exactly how to do it. There must be a way you could do it if you want, but uh, I was trying to use cross-hatching techniques one colour on top of another, leaving bits underneath, which would give you subtle uh, things. But they don't really, it didn't really work. I don't think it worked.
Well, I gave up. Uh, I gave up on that and thought it was all messy. And so you just carry on and I alter it all, take away. So now you're just seeing me filling in colour, as I say, but the colour is literally happening here on the screen, which is uh, the exciting thing about it, really. Normally, if you're putting on a great big wash, you've got a great big brush to do it with, so the hand holds it differently. One problem here is no matter what kind of mark you're making, you're still gripping this same little ballpoint pen. Well, you know, no artist is quite used to that. Turning into David Graves uh, now, who was with us uh, because I abandoned uh, uh, the portrait of uh, Francis Bacon. Uh, uh, David Graves is a, an optimist about something, <laughs> uh, <coughs> like I am. David Gray is I'm forever working with, so I know him very well, and uh, his face, I know. I mean, Francis, I don't know at all. I'd only seen him on TV, and I realized, unless I've looked at a face, looked around it a lot, uh, been with it a lot, I mean, oh, you can't do portraits. That's why I don't... You can't really just have somebody come in, sit down, and then you draw them. I mean, what would you know about... You don't know enough about them. Harder to think in volumes with this. I'm trying, I know. Very blue eyes here, which must be a trick of the camera. Uh, my eyes aren't that blue. Oh, I see, it's the reflection of this blue. Well, you can start with any colour you want. Uh, and naturally, I, you know, I'm not interested in subduing the colours because it seems to me what this is all about is this, these wonderful colours that you can use and uh, that you don't normally see. I think this is a drawing of uh, Pembroke Studios in London, just, again, from memory. I'm drawing the inside and the outside. Um, the red on the left was the wall outside. This is a green chair in the inside, and so on. Um, 
I was trying to get into perspective ideas that I'd been exploring in other pictures, um, but I haven't quite explored it enough to really develop it here yet. Uh, although I think that's, again, the area. The moment you leave the camera behind, you can forget perspective. And uh, we could all start seeing the world in a much more interesting way. You have to realize I'm drawing just from yeah, you're kind of doodling around, but uh, uh, yeah, they're discovering. It's just discovering what you're doing. So I put a car in here that you can see the front and back of the car. It means you're walking past it. It was parked outside in the street. Um, there's a lot of cars parked in the street. That's why I drew it.
I think now I'd draw a table. I simply removed the chairs and decided to put a table there, put some flowers on it. I don't know, usually put flowers there. Again, in paint, that line would be showing through. And it isn't showing through much. It's no need to show through at all if I really put it on densely. The pictures just grew and I followed them. Uh, what happens, I mean, I just kept, as I realised, you could change it more and more. You just simply let, uh, I just simply let one thing grow into another, that's all. Eventually we put a, a horse comes into the room and the car disappears. I suppose some people might think, oh, this is all much too bright. But again, you'll only think that because of what other pictures have done to us, always distancing us and always therefore making colour uh, less important. Here comes a horse uh, coming into the picture with its two feet, trying to gallop in. Uh, you know, it's just obviously now you just start following some of the shapes you've made and you suddenly see it. You made it as one thing and you suddenly see it make it into another, um, which uh, any uh, Artists would do. I mean, most things when you begin a painting, you're not exact. You don't really know what it's going to look like. There's a point where you let the marks take over. And here, then, you can take a bit and uh, make it bigger. Then, you, when you put it back, it will naturally, what you're drawing here now, is a finer line, or it will appear finer. I think this was the thinnest line you could draw. And it would probably be the thinnest line that would appear a line on this TV screen. Uh, you know, I'm only exploring uh, one or two aspects of this machine. I rejected some of the technical tricks it could do because it seemed to me what's much more interesting is making a picture with your hand.
uh, you decide, well, the, uh, the pot is on the edge of the table, so you literally draw it on the edge and so on. You see, I suppose if you turned up the colour on your ordinary TV set now, it would glow even more, wouldn't it? You start getting uh, much greater illusions now, don't Jolly you? Well do, isn't yeah. It? I mean, yeah. It's fabulous, that top. There we are, so it all changed. It's a horse galloping in to eat the flowers now. But in a way, what I realize as well is it isn't just the finished picture you the concern with is actually what's fascinating is watching it being done. <laughs> now I'm putting the shadows at the table in. Car, the car's disappeared. Yeah. I suppose with this technique, you've finished any time you want really I mean or or because if you go on and on all that happens is just you still you just keep altering the whole picture you suddenly take something out again I mean if I'd have gone on and on the horse would have gone there might be another car over there there might be something else I mean there's a point where maybe you just think it's dense and so you stop
The painter Larry Rivers found his way into the first rank of American contemporary artists by a characteristically eccentric route. He was one of the most distinctive talents to emerge from the Beat generation, the New York Bohemia that included his friends Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac. He'd begun to paint in the 1940s, and over the decades his defiantly individual style has led him to experiment with sculpture, with found images like photographs and graphics, and more recently with video. He'd started out as a musician. He was a Juilliard music scholar, he played tenor sax in a jazz band, at one point he nearly gave up painting to write poetry, and he even won the television quiz game The $64,000 Question, answering questions on modern art. Rivers is now in his 60s and still looking so to new I mean, forms and new methods in his art. Okay, Green, look up. All right, let's see if we can do this. Okay. Let's see if we should now begin. Uh, I guess what we could do is just get the shape. Let's get the shape where the eyes are, something like that, and then right. I could just start. So now, right? but you got to. All right. Uh, look, look a little more to me, because I do see both ears. All you right. got it. Now you are okay. So your eyes are green, aren't they? I think so. Green. Is that what they call you, green? I chose it for myself when I was. <laughs> I've been doing nothing in particular. To say that you're green means that you're inexperienced. Mm. Anyway. You didn't explain why you liked photographs better. Why I something like photographs that it, that it, better. It, well, I told it, you on, it, it on the level of not having to deal with people's persons. characters or the. No, I mean, you do someone's face. Mm. It's not. It's all according to how egocentric or nervous you are about what you look like. Yes. I mean, I'll catch You'll sense it. that, so yeah. to be in a room with a person that I'm painting and having to feel as if everything I do is so important to him, yeah. it's a little uh, sort of difficult. So, there it is. No, okay, um, now I've got to get a certain pink baby look that you have, and if we don't get it, artificially will be here all day. day. <laughs> okay, let's get a, all right, let's see what color that is. Much better. Uh, we can put it in and work with it later. Okay. Whereabouts? Do you live in Manhattan? Yes. Whereabouts? 14th Street. Really? It's the, the east, what is known as the East, east Village. Village. Are no, you from I'm, the from, I'm from Wales originally. Ooh. Celtic. I see. Thing. I shouldn't sound ooh like that. I actually, at one time in my life, married a girl from Wales. You're kidding? Yes just to prove how straight I am. No, I actually <laughs> did marry a girl from Wales. Um, I'm just, just going to put this. enough of your photo coming through what I'm doing mm. to see what it's about and I usually find myself thinking of it as being a little too easy and uh, Andy's things. Um. Soon I'll give up your photograph I just somehow I, I like I need crutches in mm. certain instances and then I I give it up and we'll we'll get there. Okay look at me you actually have a natural beauty mark what they call the beauty. Mark. This thing. Like a grand de beauté. A grain of beauty. Or something. Um, get this color now. Okay now. Okay. Let's 
Let's see if I can just concentrate on you for a while now. Okay. It has a certain kind of uh, uh, flatness that, uh, you know, like someone who doesn't know, uh, almost like the martial art, it looks like yes. I meant about it. That it gives you a technique that I never thought I had. In other words, I never think of myself as an illustrator in that sense, but there must be something in me that is, because as soon as one or two elements of what I'm doing change, I don't have a sloppy paintbrush and I don't have... Isn't it the case that a lot of the, the sort of way that you went about doing things, perhaps in the 60s, isn't they're that, more that, like, that whole business of sort of leaving things uncompleted yeah. and erasing and smudging has gone on to be part, become part of the yeah. vocabulary of, 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 yes. of, of commercial yeah. artists, hasn't it? It's true. Which that, in other words, you're never allowed to stand still and relax. There's always something that's happening that kind of makes something that you've done into a cliche or... I don't, I don't think it's anything that one should try and actively distance yourself from. Perhaps, I don't know what... Well, no, what I'm trying to say is that I think that this machine sort of suddenly brought out things that I, you know, that I hadn't... Realised you were doing. ...part of my... Yes. Uh, ...vocabulary or yeah. my bag of tricks. Yeah. Maybe they are. Now you've come out, you've come out handsome, but in, not in the way I see you. Now what, what the hell am I supposed to do? Let me see. We'll, we'll have <laughs> clearly to some back, mistake. Clearly some mistake. Okay. See if this does something. It's some kind of insane, lightweight notion of Hitler. I'm going to. Try to work bigger and less delicately. See if I could. What are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to get. You suddenly develop because of the position you're taking. Your jacket is is sort of looking. It's very weird because it's coming, it's creeping around mm. your face and things like that. So it's, I'm trying to get it, actually. Yeah. I'll tell you what, let's call up the old shoulders. The old shoulders? Yeah, I mean, in other words, let's get back green. You want to take a little stretch? <clears throat> oh, okay. There are like glinting highlights in your hair that I've already given up on, that right. I first actually thought I could thought get. Be nice to get, yeah. Now, you would think a machine like this, I could just press a button that says glinting yes. highlights, <laughs> and I get it. <laughs> so I'm back wherever you are. Worse. All right. Have you selected this thickness of line? I mean, presumably. You yes, you can. That's what I mean. You want to see what this, where it is? You see these dots here? Oh, I see. Right. I've chosen the one, one that's pink as uh -huh. the third. I'll show you a second. Uh, or I'll make it even this one for you. Yeah. Just for a moment, just to give you an idea. Now you got to take away the palette. Yeah. And let's say I want to make a line down here. You see how much well, heavier yeah. that is? It's She's nice. acting very stubborn. What, just uh, here, yeah. I mean, I couldn't get that line on there for a second. Just hold the pen slightly yes. more up. Like that. Do you okay. like to exploit accidents? Are you, I mean, you, well, who or are you sort of very. Jazz is an accident. I mean, or are you very concerned so to control of, the whole thing? No. Certain kind of control, but not, you know, totally. Yeah, if, well, everybody goes with accident. I mean, you've got yeah. to be an idiot. Uh, yeah. Say, no, I, I want to be in total control. 
Let's act as if all accidents are really for the better. This afternoon, a very wide no. uh, black dots. When I was younger, I could really tell when somebody did. I was just joking with you. But you could tell someone. Heroin is easy to sort of tell. To tell. I can. Eyes. I can. Yeah. I can. I guess we can't talk about it, but it's quite. I think it's well interesting. You because you had you know yeah, you actually made yeah. and a, a point of talking about making yeah. art with drugs no only the only drug i ever worked with i never worked with heroin never you didn't was good and you can't or was it amphetamine I mean, you want to let, yeah amphetamine yeah good, yeah and but most of the things that i did somehow didn't please me very much really i'm not trying to be like you know contrite mm. like in front of the jury and acting sorry for what i did but actually a lot of the things i did i would stay up all night i could stay up for three days yes, exactly yeah some of the things weren't bad I'm gonna really warm drink. I feel as if I'm working with with one hand tied behind my back instead of I mean at this point we're trying to get a kind of uh, uh, What are we trying to get? Are we trying to get some kind of semblance of me or something that's pleasing within the frame? Well, I'm trying to use this apparatus mm. in a way that doesn't differ too much from how I use, say, paint and, you know, a pencil. But somehow it isn't true. And so, yes. and we're, but we're getting a situation in which color is light, really, mm. and supposed to be sort of more exciting. It, and yet it is and it isn't. Now when you start mixing all the colors, it really starts to look like something that I, I'm not sure I like so mm. much. Let me, let me get my telescope out one second now. Get the eyes. We have to operate on them. We may as well see what we're doing. <laughs> okay. Now. Didn't you start sort of, wasn't sort of doing portraits something that you did very early on, no? I would do people's portraits, but I, I never thought that I would, I was, I was always as if... But you drew uh, your family and things, didn't yeah, you? You drew your yeah, mother and... but I, I never, th I always think portraits are things that people ask to be done or give you money to do. Mm. For me to, to make a decision to do some people, I, I didn't think of them as portraits, but I mean, I guess actually So if you, if you didn't think of them as portraits, what did you think of them as? Just devices? I was using, yeah, things to... for getting certain ideas, yeah. you know, that really is really what it amounted to. Spend five minutes on your nose yeah. right at least. now. At least. Okay. It deserves at least five minutes. Okay. We've got to get the nose. The nose, nose. Go. We're moving. I could see how if you spend
spent about six years on this thing, you could really start. Look, look at that tone, what it's doing. It took me all day to get that. I didn't. Is, no, yeah. how's this machine is so fantastic. Blissfully in a way. ignorant. It's so fantastic in a way. What's going it, on? It takes us. Now, let's see. All right. Anyway. You ever go for a note? Oh, you, you sort of say you, you're on a thing. But it's like you go for a note and you really fall about oh, yes. one tone. Honestly, less. yes. I Not because, you know, you, it just. I don't know, you didn't. Get it right, but what like, do you play? Tennis sax at the moment. And you're sort of still out gigging and yeah, things. we do it. It's a curious audience we have, yeah. but I, we, we, what do we care? I mean, we blow. I sort of wanted to try this, right? I'm mm. trying it with vengeance for going on the air. <laughs> I'm not trying it, I'm doing it, you know, and I'm yes. sort of doing it in a way that it's like trying to learn a bicycle bicycle riding in, in you know, in five minutes in a certain way. It's quite hard. Mm. When I get desperate in painting, I all sorts of things can happen. Here it's a little more difficult. Now let's see something. Well, when you started drawing and painting from photographs, which is a long time ago now, were there, were there lots of other people doing it? I mean, was that... I don't know, because um, I, uh, I hid it for a very long time. Did you? I used to paint over photographs of my own work. I mean, it, may, it did away with some certain problems. What, and you were worried that that was somehow ch well, would be perceived as cheating? Well, people still are telling me even today that uh, mm. they, they act as if you're cheating. That's crazy. They, they'll come in, they'll see a painting of mine, they know that I, they can't tell when I use it, when I don't. They'll still say, did you use a, a projector or not? Did you? So I say, well, what do you think? <laughs> and they're totally confused. But, but that's, just that's so to, silly, it seems to well, me. Well, you'd be surprised. Well, how about... You know, did you sing it or oh, was it void, oh, you know, right. that kind of thing? Yes. You look a little too respectable. <laughs> Your <laughs> is Larry in command. Okay, finito. Next. Benito, finito. <laughs> Thank you. 
The painter Howard Hodgkin was Britain's representative at the Venice Biennale in 1984, and in 1985 he won the prestigious Tate Gallery Turner Prize. When we introduced him to the Quantel paint box, he decided to experiment over two days with some ideas for sets and costumes for Stravinsky's Commedia dell'arte ballet, Pulcinella. <laughs> proscenium of the Grand Theatre at Leeds, where the first performance of a new production of the ballet Pulcinella by Stravinsky will be presented by Ballet Rambert, with choreography by Richard Alston and sets and costumes by myself. Pulcinella was first presented by Diaghilev in 1920 with sets by Picasso, choreography by Massine, and music by Stravinsky after Pergolesi. It was very useful to be able to make a stencil for the costumes, which can then be just filled in with different patterns. The costume design, apart from this one, which would mean dyeing the dance of blue or hazel in the parts you could see, are mostly things which I think I will use. Senior March as such, but 
the edge of the screen. Because I, I want to make an illusionistic pattern very often on this on this screen, so it'll be like a a stage within a stage, or sort of little, little almost like a puppet theatre, which, without being in any way a, a literal repetition, would be like the Commedia dell'arte stages that were set up in the street. But the trouble, of course, with using a Commedia dell'arte convention is that it's been done to death almost every generation. And equally, of course, the great advantage of it is that it's such a cliché. If one can only make it strongly enough a cliché, then you can do quite the opposite with it. with a light pen quite smartly to get one of these spots and they are very difficult to control and so it's really the rhythm of the movement and the desperation which, with which the movements are made that produces this effect I don't at all understand how the machine works but in so far as what one can do with it some of it is incredibly easy like these painted brush strokes made by just sort of scratching the surface quite lightly and you get an effect which is beautifully liquid but the spots are another matter they're really a physical killer to execute but for me the enormous and in the end crippling disadvantage of using this technique is that you have to think so quickly. The concentration is totally different from when one's using a gouache, for example, or acrylic, any kind of paint. It's only doing this that one realizes what well, a lot of time is spent washing out the brush, mixing the color, applying it to the paper. Time in which one can consider and think and no doubt feel with this, you will have to do all that immediately, and it's incredibly f fatiguing, and I think probably in the end, for me, misleading. I think it's misleading most because some of the effects are so easy to get, and they have nothing to do with the real world. They're not like a piece of paper you hold in your hand or can hang on the wall. They have no physical life other than when they're being projected. And so... I don't feel any kind of physical affinity, really, with what I'm doing and with what I see on the screen. That's why you see these rather <coughs> strained and anguished expressions on my face. Uh, they're really the attempt to relate the normal way I would feel to something which is totally alien to it. It has no texture, for example. You have none of the checks and balances of moving a brush across a rough surface which resists and therefore affects what you do. And perhaps <coughs> even using it for something as really quite practical as this, it's sort of building castles in the air. To 
be forced to think at appalling speed and to be put in an instant sort of anxiety state by the demands of this machine <coughs> has been extremely useful. It's filled me with ideas which I probably would have taken months and months to even get near. It's the pressure of having to work so fast, to think so quickly, and to think so radically in some ways. It's clearly very useful. I think far more useful than the actual images that have been produced. American artist Jennifer Bartlett has become known as one of the most original image makers of her generation. She reproduces a very individual view of the world around her in an enormous variety of ways. Some of her pictures are exuberant, informal, full of color. Others she makes out of powerful, abstract or geometric shapes. These shapes may be multiplied in one picture or she will integrate familiar forms into a strong graphic framework. Jennifer Bartlett works in New York and in Paris. Her interest in designing and laying out gardens has become an important adjunct to her work as a painter. So I have my lines, and I want the, I have black, where are you? This is, I can never find this guy. It's a case of aim and fire, really, isn't it? What? It's aim and fire. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> oh, I like doing this. I mean, there's definitely a neck. I mean, I can't guarantee I'm going to get it right first time, but... Yeah. <clears throat> oh, quite, that's very good. Should we go with that? Mm-hmm. I think I'll... I think to... I'll just do it freehand from, yeah. from now on. Right. Maybe let's get this center one. Okay. You've really got to do it quite visually, and you've got to sort of say, oh, that's, that's not bad, is it? better than mine. <laughs> I've been using photographs in my work for the last four years and it's kind of like a, from my point of view, a nasty habit. I, it originally started out quite innocently where I wanted to record some specific information about a particular area that I was living in that I had to leave before I finished the number of drawings I wanted to do about it. And then I just began liking the specific quality of information that I could use in a studio situation. I was hoping that the machine would reveal something <laughs> to me that would make it absolutely clear that I had to give up using these uh, photographs as soon as possible. And I do think, in looking at it, that it has revealed this to me.
I'm a great believer in rules. Sort of or arbitrary organizing principles against chaos. And also, if when you go into the studio, you have something very specific to do, and you aren't having to wait for inspiration, <laughs> it's quite helpful. When you look at a painting, you know that it's one foot square, or it's six feet by seven feet, or it's a hundred by a hundred feet. And those would have d different kinds of impressions just by your sheer physicality. You won't know that in a, say, in a photograph or on television unless you have something in relationship to it. So you have to see the painting with something else to define part of the properties or characteristics. interesting. Right? The most interesting thing to me is to work two days on a series of drawings which do not exist. Now that <laughs> interests me, but that's a little bit perverse, isn't it? But I do quite like that, that there, there were n never any real drawings, though they have the appearance of being real drawings. I wasn't interested in what I could take home with me, uh, but I hoped I would see something that I didn't expect. And I probably did. I'm just not sure what it is at this point. Because this is very different than looking at, looking at a drawing. It's just not a drawing. It's much more transparent than a drawing would be. It occupies a different kind of space. The whole thing in the first place is constantly in motion that's perceptible because it's TV. I mean, any inch of the, the screen that you look at, no image is ever stable. It's always wiggling around to one degree or another, which is the nature of this medium and, and the way that drawing looks reflects it. Would never look the same on paper. Would never look the same in a photographic print. Never look the same really on a movie screen. And I like that watching that little animated X moving around. It, it never had any clear relationship to my hand. You know, sometimes I would just simply stop drawing and ex expect the little plus to keep moving because I was very interested. I think so possibly this machine could, could create an entire large group of schizophrenics <laughs> who didn't know where they ended in, in the material world.
I guess I'm so used to and bored with the way that I think. Do you know, I keep hoping for a kind of miracle that I will have somebody else's thought as if it were my own. I was hoping that the Quantel machine would sort of lure a previously undiscovered, dark, lurking corner of my mind into existence. However, it didn't. It was the same old way that I draw.